Welcome back to the course in nuclear medicine physics. Today we'll be looking at different types of nuclear decay. These include three different types of decays, alpha, beta, and gamma decays. And it includes ejecting different types of particles from an unstable nuclide. This essentially makes up the foundation of what we know as radioactivity. If you enjoy this video, as always, like and subscribe. There'll be plenty more videos in this lecture series in the future. And enjoy this video. start talking about the types of nuclear decays. Well, in nuclear medicine, because that's what we're interested in, in this course, depending on the decay, we have two applications. We either use isotopes, radioisotopes for imaging or radioisotopes for therapy. So in imaging, we're, we're going to use isotopes that have isomeric transitions or positron emissions. And in therapy, we're going to use isotopes that decay via beta minus emissions or alpha particle emissions. So what's exactly that? Well, first of all, we're interested in three processes, in three properties every time we talk about nuclear decay. We're interested in the type of nuclear emissions. So particles come out of those nuclei. Are they charged particles or are they non-charged particles like gammas, which are photons? What is the energy of those emissions? And what is the decay rate? How, how many of those particles are we getting? So let's start talking about beta decay. Beta decay is the most common type of decay. We have been, it has been detected in isotopes of almost all elements. And again, when this decay happens, it's because you have a nucleide, a nucleus that is in a non very stable configuration and it goes through beta decay to approach the line of stability. There are two types of beta decay. One is beta minus, one is beta plus. In beta minus, you have a neutron in the nucleus that becomes a proton, but then that process involves the release of a beta minus particle and an anti electron neutrino. Uh, because you have a neutron becoming a proton, that means that you gain a proton, so your element changes, there's a transmutation, but the mass is kept the same. So you went from element X to element Y because you gain a proton, but both of them have the same mass. And in that process, you release a beta minus. Similarly, in positron emission in beta plus, you have a proton that turns into a neutron, releasing a positron and a and an electron neutrino. So here you lose a proton, so your element changes again, but your mass stays the same. Well, so we can plot this in like energy diagrams. So think about moving to the right as increasing Z, and these are energy levels. So you have your parent nuclei, that decays via beta minus, we saw how it gains a proton. So it moves to the right. And well, and there's some difference in energies there. That difference in energy is what we call the Q value or transitional energy, is the energy that is released in that decay. So going from this parent to this daughter releases that energy. For the case of beta minus decay, it turns out that that energy has to do with the, the mass of the final, the mass of the daughter minus the mass of the parent. And it's only allowed if the mass of the parent is greater than the mass of the daughter. I think I have a typo there. So let's look at, let's look at those, uh, how did we get there? So the Q value of transitional energy, again, is defined as the energy released in the nuclear decay. Because of conservation of energy, then that would mean if this is the equation for beta decay, it would mean that the initial energy, the initial rest energy plus the initial kinetic energy should be equal to the final rest energy plus the final kinetic energy. This is just conservation of energy. 
and where T and where T initial and T final are the initial and final kinetic energies of the different particles. Uh, so look at this equation and I can subtract this on that side and I can subtract this on this side. So we have this equation here and this is exactly Q. So Q is MI minus NFC squared and this is Q. So it's gonna be equal to the difference in kinetic energies. Okay, so what's our initial energy? Well, our initial energy was the res mass of a nucleus that had Z protons and A and a, and a, and a total mass of A. And our final energy was, is a, a nucleus that has Z plus one protons, a mass of A, but we also have the res mass of a beta particle and we also have the res mass of an antineutrino. And so this is the left side here, and that's equal to the final kinetic energy. That would be the kinetic energy of this nucleus here, the Z plus one A, plus the kinetic energy of the beta particle, plus the kinetic energy of the antineutrino. And the initial energy would be the kinetic energy of the original nucleus. Well, we can assume that this decay occurs at rest. So this term basically goes to zero. There's no kinetic energy, it's at rest. And that the daughter nucleus be, well, is so heavy compared to the beta particle and to the antineutrino that basically all the kinetic energy is gonna be taken by those other two particles. So we can also think of this being very, very small. And then we know that the mass of the antineutrino is very, very, very small compared to, to the other particles. So we can also think that this has not really much contribution to that equation. So you can reorganize the terms, um, but again, it's really, is much easier to measure the mass of the atoms as a whole and not of the nuclei. So we can think that the mass of the atom, we can write it as the mass of the nucleus plus the mass of the electrons around it minus the binding energy of those electrons. When you're gonna plug that into that equation, you're gonna end up with a term like this. And we're gonna assume that, and well, that difference between binding energies in, in those two different atoms is, is very, very small. It's almost zero. You can reorganize and we see that the Q value of a beta minus emission has to do with, this is the parent atom, this is the daughter atom. I encourage you to look at this in more detail at home. All the steps are there. I just cannot go into too much detail here because then we're probably not gonna finish, but look at this. But the important message here is in beta minus decay, we know that this is the amount of energy that is released. So if energy is released, it means that is Q less than, smaller than zero, is Q equal zero, is Q greater than zero? Uh, what do you think? I guess if you're not sure between A and C, you would press D just to make yeah. sure it's one of those two, but uh, try to be more specific. You know, would you go for A or C? Unless you think it's B. Okay, I'll stop in five seconds. Yeah, so look at the results. Most people went with C. And yeah, that's the right answer. So we, we refer to this. Okay. If Q is greater than zero, we know that energy is being released. So what does that mean? What does that mean for, for the beta decay? So when is beta decay allowed? Mm 
and this is going pretty quick, so I'm gonna stop in five seconds. Exactly, so again, most people only see it, so exactly. So let's keep in mind, so we can only have beta minus decay when the parent, when the mass of the parent atom is greater than the mass of the daughter atom. And yeah, we have a D answer. <laughs> okay, so I don't know, are there any questions up to this point? Um, this is just summarizing what we just talked about. I just didn't want to show you these equations, but just like this, we went through why is this like that? And yeah, take a look, close it with more time by yourself. So this is in general, how beta minus emission occurs, but then I'm talking about a neutron becoming a proton. And wow, well, okay, how can a neutron become a proton? That sounds weird. And it's, it's really, really cool. I mean, this, if, if you wanna really go deep, I encourage you to take like a nuclear physics course, but, but protons and neutrons are composed of even smaller particles that we call quarks. So when you look at a neutron, a neutron is composed by a down, an up, and a down quark. And a proton is composed by a down, an up, and an up quark. So going from neutron to proton means that one of those down quarks became an up quark. And that occurs because, okay, look, this is, if this is a neutron and this is a proton, one of those down quarks, which is the one I have here on the top, there's an interaction happening there that is caused by this W minus boson. And that's the weak force. So this is the weak force is responsible for this decay. And when there's that interaction, we end up with an electron and an antineutrino, which is basically the beta particle and the electron. And when that down turns to up, you end up with a proton. So this is something interesting here. I'm showing here, this is an electron and I'm calling this a, part, a beta minus particle. So I want you guys to think, what is the difference between an electron and a beta minus particle? What's the difference in charge between a, an electron and a beta minus particle? Which one has a higher charge or which one has a smaller charge or do they have the same charge? Yeah, so in the chat, people are saying no difference in charge. So that's correct. The charge between an electron and a beta minus, they're exactly the same. Is there any difference in mass? So, the, so is the mass different? Some people are saying that the mass is different. So what is more massive, an electron or a beta minus particle? Is that different? Okay, so the real answer, and I know people are debating in the chat, but the answer is no, the beta minus and an electron, they have exactly the same mass. So beta minus and electron, they have same charge, they have the same mass. So why, when do we really differentiate? Why do we then call electron and why do we call beta particle? And the answer for this, and I want you guys to remember this, well, when, when you talk about electrons, you are referring to the atom in general. You're referring to, you have electrons orbiting around a, 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 a nucleus. When we talk about a main, by beta minus particle, and that's the slide that I have here. We know that the beta particle, it looks just like an electron, but a beta minus particle always comes from the nucleus. So an electron, you have it around the atom. A beta particle, if someone talks to you about a beta particle, you immediately know, okay, that particle comes from the nucleus. It's not from the atom. And yeah, and that's why we call this a nuclear decay. And in nuclear medicine, we're gonna use a lot of beta particles for different purposes. And because those beta particles come from the nucleus, that's in part is why nuclear medicine is also called nuclear medicine. Well, I just- as I, I may add, sort of like sometimes you might have the exact same energy for an X-ray or a gamma ray, uh, you know, and so people ask, 
well, what's the difference between an X-ray and, and a gamma ray if they have the exact same energy? So it's the same thing, Carlos, right? Yeah, now we're gonna get there, yes. Oh, so you're gonna actually talk about it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So an example of a better emission is lutetium-177 becomes hafnium-177 by gaining a, a, a proton and it releases this energy. And if you look at the chart of nucleides, what's happening is in beta minus, um, you are losing one neutron, you are gaining one proton, so you're moving towards the line of stability in that direction, in this direction. Okay, now I'm gonna speed up a little bit, but similar idea when you talk about beta plus, now you have a proton that becomes a neutron releasing a positron and an, and an electron neutrino. Um, yeah, so here you actually go from here to there because you lose a proton. Again, the Q value for the case of this beta plus decay, it actually looks something like this. So I'm not gonna show this one. I show you the first one. I encourage you to try to do this one by yourself. So this is only allowed if the mass of the parent is greater than the mass of the daughter plus two masses of an electron. So keep that in mind, try to do it by yourself. An example is fluorine 18 decaying to oxygen 18 uh, well, by releasing a positron emission. And this one I'm showing is very interesting for our applications. We use this in positron emission tomography and we'll get there later, but keep that in mind because you're gonna see this isotope a lot. If, if okay. I may add that, if you could go back one slide, please. Um, yeah, so so the the one that you showed uh, two electrons, the difference should be more than two electrons, sorry. Oh, this, yeah. yeah, so if, um, in the book, we also uh, talk about this. So, so, you know, again, try to work this out, but in, in page uh, 13, of chapter two, we explain you know, in detail why that is. So if you're not sure, I mean, try to work it out, but if you're not sure, take a look at there and you, you'll, you'll see, hopefully, yeah. And then, well, looking at from this perspective, now we are going from a proton to a neutron is one of those up quarks become a down quark. Again, similar, but now this is caused by the W plus boson and you end up with a neutrino and a positron. And again, what's the difference between a positron and, a, well, I guess it's just called a positron, but yeah, sorry. So it's a positron is exactly the same mass of an, as an electron or as a beta, part, beta minus particle. It's just that the charge is the same magnitude, but this is a positive charge. Okay, so these emissions, these beta plus and beta minus emissions, we can somehow measure them. And when we look at the spectrum, so a spectrum means you plot the energy of the particles that are coming out from that radioisotope. And, and okay, and just think about this for a moment. You're going from one state, from one parent, we're going down to another state from a daughter. There's a difference in energy there. So you're thinking, okay, then, okay, that difference in energy should be the one that the beta plus particle carries. But when people started looking at this, they were like, okay, but we go and measure it and we see that there's a lot of energies. It's not just that energy difference. We're seeing what is called a continuous spectrum, both for the beta minus and the beta plus. And I mean, and the particle that we're able to measure from here is the beta particle. So I know there was a neutrino there, but people just started measuring and we cannot really easily measure a neutrino. People just were seeing at the, the beta particle. So again, if, if we're going from one state to the other, why are we seeing a continuous spectrum? It should go just like a fixed energy difference. But that's only true if there was only one particle being emitted uh, because there's a continuous spectrum, then that's what led Wolfgang Pauli to postulate that there had to be an existence of another particle. And that's when we came up with the idea of the neutrino and Fermi ended up bringing that. And 
That's why we now know that that decay actually also has an emission of a neutrino. It's not just a beta particle. And if now you have two particles coming out of that decay, then that difference in energy can be shared between the two particles. Sometimes the neutrino is gonna take slightly more energy than the beta. Sometimes the beta is gonna take most of the energy and that's what ends up making the, the continuous spectrum. And that's all these decays what led us to know, hey, there's, a, there's another particle existing in the universe. And now we know that that is the neutrino. Now, just to add, when you have this spectrum, we know that the maximum energy of, that the beta particle can have is that difference between the state of the parent and the daughter. It cannot have more than that, but it can be shared. And on average, the energy of a beta particle coming from a decay is more or less around one third of the maximum allowed energy from that decay. That's beta decay. Let me see, are there any questions? Someone is asking if an electron is also emitting alongside the beta particle. So no, from these beta decays, you only have the beta particle being emitted with a neutrino. And it's an electron neutrino, but, but it's a neutrino. Now, there's another process that is called electron capture. And I have it here because electron capture actually competes with beta plus decay. So what is electron capture? The thing you have, you have your nucleus and your nucleus has positive charges. This nucleus captures an electron from the inner, well, from the shells of the atom. And think about conservation of charge kind of thing. So you have a proton, now you have an electron that somehow came into the nucleus and this is gonna become a, ne a neutron. And you're gonna have a neutron plus a neutrino because you lose a proton, then you go from element X to element Y. Um, yeah, your element changes. Uh, it's only allowed if the mass of the parent is greater than the mass of the daughter plus the binding energy of that electron that was captured to, to, the, to the atom. Does the neutrino has mass or energy? So yes, as I said, the the neutrino is going to have uh, some of that kinetic energy, and that's why it's shared with uh, with uh, with the beta particle. And I think the neutrino, I think the neutrino does have some mass, but it's very, very, very small. So it's really, really hard to measure. Exactly, neutrino has a super small rest mass, and it's really hard to measure because of that. Well, in this electron capture, the electron is most commonly captured from the K shell, which is the innermost shell. We refer to this as K capture, the capture an electron from the K shell. Electron capture from higher shells is also possible, but is way less probable. So, I mean, you can also have L capture and M capture, but that's less, less possible. Well, so this is just a big overview of beta decay. If you really, really are interested and you want to go deeper into the formalism of this beta decay, I suggest you go and read about the Fermi theory of beta decay. And of course, that's going to give you more details. You're going to look into quantum mechanics and Schrodinger equations and things like that. Let's go to the next type of decay. It's what we call gamma decay. Okay, sorry, um, Armand was writing in the chat. We see, sorry, let's talk about gamma decay just for a moment. So gamma decay occurs when a nucleus is in an excited state and it releases this energy by emitting a proton, by emitting some electromagnetic radiation. Well, in this case, you are not losing a proton or you are not gaining a proton. There is no change in Z or A. So that means you started with element X and you end up with still element X. It's just an excited state of that element of that nucleus that releases a gamma, releases some fo a photon, and that di di excitation can occur from an excited state directly to the ground state or from one excited state to another excited state. So here I have, for example, an, a, a diagram of technetium 99. It has two energy levels. Um, this one here can come down to the ground state directly and the difference in energy is shown there. 
this one can also come down to the ground state or there can be a photon between B state and this one and we just kind of have a different energy. Okay, but then, yeah, so, so why is that when you have this nucleus with slightly more energy, it actually releases gamma rays? And, and, and a big overview is you can think as having a nucleus that this has this little excess of energy. So these gamma rays are emitted because these charges inside the nucleus are moving and they are uh, reshaping itself. They are accommodating in a different way. So you have basically an electric current. And when the nucleus changes from that initial configuration to that other final configuration, that's basically like seeing an antenna broadcasting electromagnetic waves. So antennas work by basically moving charges and there's this thing called dipoles and quadrupoles and so on. And when you move charges, you will basically end up having electromagnetic waves. So is that, that's what's happening. This changing configuration inside the nucleus is changing that configuration of the charges, you're moving charges. And that's why electromagnetic waves, electromagnetic radiation is emitted. And that's what we see as a photon that we called a gamma. All the formalism for gamma decay is really, really given by quantum electrodynamics. You guys can go and look at this, but this is just a big overview. It's just imagine it's a little antenna that's changing its configuration and that's what we see these photons. Um, now we call it gamma decay. This again is what Armand was saying a moment ago, but I'm saying these are photons. This is electromagnetic radiation. So when we talked about that last lecture about X-rays, we said, okay, then it's when we have some photons coming out of the atom. Right now I'm saying we have some photons coming out of the nucleus, but so what is the difference between a gamma and an X-ray if both are photons? And it's just basically the name, but it's just to differentiate. We know that when people are talking about an X-ray, a characteristic X-ray is because an electron filled an empty shell of, of the atom. When people talk about gammas, it's because we know that gamma is coming out from the nucleus. So again, gammas from the nucleus, X-rays from the atom, electrons from the atom, beta particles from the nucleus. So keep that in mind. And we have what is called isomeric and metastable states. So we're talking about the excited states of the nucleus. So generally, um, in, in, well, generally speaking, excited states of nuclei decaying at too short of a time to be directly measured. However, well, we have what we call an isomeric state, which is an excited state of nucleus that they do exist for a time that allows us to actually measure it. So the left time is basically, if it's higher than 10 to the minus 12 seconds, 12 picoseconds, we are, we are, we are, we are able to measure that. So what is a metastable state? And well, a metastable state is again, is also an excited state of the nucleus. And the difference between a, pure isomeric state is that a metastable state uh, exists for a period of time that is longer in comparison to other isomeric states, but it's still not a stable configuration. So it's still gonna decay. So a lot of metastable states, you are actually able to measure it like with a, with a watch, like with the chrono on every watch. Um, so the only difference between excited state and metastable states is their lifetime. And let me show you again, the biggest example in nuclear medicine is technetium 99. So look, so this is what I was showing a moment ago. We have some excited, okay, this is the ground state, but we have some excited states. So you can see that this, this state, for example, lasts 0 0.19 nanoseconds. This state has a life of around 3.61 nanoseconds. So that's short. And we have this state that lives for around six hours. So here, okay, well, six hours is definitely longer than these two that are in nanoseconds. So for this six hour one is what we call a metastable state of technetium 99. They are all excited state, but this one, this one here is longer 
than the other two. And that's why we, we call it a meta civil state. And, and everyone, you don't have, you don't need special equipment to be able to measure six hours. So, um, oh yeah, and again, well, here we're going from one energy state to another. There's no other particles being released. So the energy spectrum in gamma decay is actually discrete. So we have fixed energies of those photons, of those gammas coming out of that nucleus. There's this thing also called beta gamma decay. So that happens when a beta decay results in an excited state of the daughter. And then that excited state of the daughter emits gammas, well, to come down to, to its ground state. So, yeah. So an example is again, lutetium-177 decays by beta minus and it becomes hadmium. And it typically comes to an excited state of hadmium that then goes down to its ground state by emitting some gamma. So we have in this decay of lutetium, as you see, we're gonna have some betas and we're gonna end up with some gammas because of that excited state of the daughter. Another example, this is how we look in a diagram, lutetium by beta decay to hadmium and then hadmium down to ground state of hadmium emits gammas. Or molybdenum-99, which is actually the parent apparent for technetium-99, can decay by beta minus to that metastable state of technetium, which is the six hour one. And then we have some emissions from that metastable state. It's really important isotopes that undergo beta minus gamma decay are usually not solely used for imaging. So in nuclear medicine, we're gonna use the gammas coming out from different radioisotopes. Those are gonna be very useful for us to create images, but the beta particles are very well, the beta minus particles are very useful for us to treat tumors, for example. We know that beta minus particles can destroy the DNA of cancer cells. So having an isotope like any of the ones listed here on the, on the table on the left, these are all examples of isotopes that have beta minus gamma decay kind of in a chain. Well, we can use this one to image because we can use the gammas to create images, but then we can use them at the same time to treat those tumors. So we can see what we're treating at the same time. And there's gonna be some lectures about this field much, much deeper. So we'll get there. Yeah, I was going to add, that's fantastic. Yeah, so this sort of is a natural link to theranostics, you know, combining diagnostics and therapeutics. So when we talk about our chapter five and in a future session, we're going to go over these deeply. And it's a very, very exciting, and interesting uh, area in nuclear medicine. So we'll talk about those in detail later. Yeah, and the reason I talk too much about technician is because this is kind of the most important transition in nuclear medicine basically 70% of all diagnostic nuclear medicine procedures use that isotope because we use that metastable state and we measure these, these are more than 142 kV photons. But lastly, if, we're if, almost there. Sorry? If I may comment, could you go back? Uh, please note that because we're talking about, no, no, the next slide, we're talking about um, therapy, uh, sorry, imaging, in the imaging part, we're not going to be using molybdenum. We're going to be using technetium. So it's, we're going to be using the daughter uh, mm. only. So we're going to talk about those, how you separate them, how you just uh, essentially separate the daughter from the parent, et cetera. But please note that what we inject into our patients is not molybdenum because that would be emitting both uh, electrons, you know, the, the beta minus, uh, which is not exactly a healthy thing, right? That's for, that, that actually is used for, for therapy. So we're not gonna use that. We're just gonna use the technician part. So we're gonna go into a lot of detail into those later. The last decay that I'm gonna talk about is what is called, as, as what is known as alpha decay. So alpha decay is basically a Coulomb repulsion effect in which the nucleus reduces that repulsion effect from positive charges only in the nucleus by getting rid of positive charges. So you start with a nucleus X and it's gonna lose two protons and two neutrons. So it ends up losing a mass of four. 
And in that process, it releases what we call an alpha particle, which is basically the, the, the nucleus of a helium-4, well, it's basically a helium-4 nucleus, two protons and two, and two neutrons. And here I have a slide that is blank, just because I can move really quick to this, but so again, you're gonna, I'm not gonna see my face for a moment. But the way to understand alpha decay, and I, and I find it very interesting, is let's think that we're bringing an, an alpha particle. Again, it has two protons. Let's say we come from infinity and we start bringing it closer and closer to a nucleus. When we're inside the nucleus, all that strong force is basically gonna cause an attraction of the alpha particle into, hold on. So hold on. Basically what I'm gonna get at is, if we think about the potential that's gonna keep this inside the nucleus, if you think that the nucleus has a radius big R, if we're inside the nucleus, it's gonna be an attractive potential. So it's gonna be something like this. But the moment that we go out of the nucleus, it's just gonna feel that Coulomb effect that is pushing it away. And Coulomb effect potentials look something like this. And you can think that you have your alpha particle inside the nucleus. So, and this alpha particle, well, it's moving inside the nucleus. It comes here, it bounces back. And in classical physics, in what we see every day, if you jump into a wall, well, you get hit really hard and you bounce back. But in this level of, in this kind of uh, nuclear level, there's all the types of rules that govern what happens. So over there, you actually have a chance that if that alpha particle hits this wall, it can go through the wall and it can find and then at the end re come out on the other side. And that's what in quantum mechanics is called um, tunneling effect. And so this is exactly what's happening. So you can think that you have these alpha particles inside the nucleus. You have the alpha particles inside the nucleus and they're basically bouncing it out until at some point some of them can tunnel outside of the nucleus and well we get an alpha particle outside uh, now what i really wanted to bring up as well is because this part is exponential so you can have an alpha particle that has a higher energy that is probably gonna very easily go through that very narrow wall out there but another alpha particle that is not that energetic has to go a much, much longer distance inside the wall. And it's because that exponential, if you guys go and look at the half-lives of how, what is the existence of, of an alpha emitter, you see a very, very big range of half-lives. So some of them, uh, like basically you cover a lot of different magnitudes of half life so some of them live very short and some of them live very long and it's because of that exponential effect there so i don't know this is just an example it's just to give a brief idea of why alpha decay happens the same way as i show you why gamma decay and beta decay happen this is exactly what i mean particles inside the nucleus bouncing in and out and some of them are able to go through that wall so yeah if you look at the nuclei chart when you have an alpha decay, you basically move in this direction towards the line of stability. Positron, you move in that direct. Positron, you move in this direction, and beta minus, you move in this direction. But then the question is, okay, this nucleus can get rid of those positive charges. I mean, in principle, you can think it could throw out two pro, sorry, one proton, or it can get rid of maybe five protons. Why is not like a neutron, the one that is releasing? Why is it a helium-4? Why is it not one of those other particles? Any, have, anyone have an idea about that? I mean, the nucleus in principle could, could just throw another particle, but no, we always get, we get an alpha particle, a helium-4 nucleus. Okay. So think about this again. It has to do with the binding energy. And the reason is, if you look at this helium-4, remember, helium-4 was one of those magic numbers. It has a 
particularly high large binding energy. So that means its mass is especially small. So it's because that, I mean, if you want to split it into like just one proton, then you have to step in even more energy to be able to do that. So at the end of the day, it's much, much easier for the nucleus to just get rid of this very tightly bound particle that has this particularly small mass. So it has a particularly high Q value and, and that's why. So if you look, for example, at the energy release in different decay modes of uranium-232, you can think, okay, let's look at uranium-232, let's think what's gonna, what needs to happen for, for that nucleus to get rid of a neutron. Okay, you need this energy. To get rid of a proton, okay, you would need that energy. To get rid of a deuteron, to get rid of a tritium, and so on and so on. And what you see there is, again, because of what I just said, the only particle that is allowed is the alpha particle, because this will be the energy to be released. It's the only one that is positive. There's, to be able to get rid of another particle, you would actually have to put some energy into the system. Um, okay, and now let's see what else can happen. I was talking about gamma decay a moment ago, but there's this other thing called internal conversion. So when we have these metastables or excited state of a nucleus, we saw, okay, in most cases, there's uh, a, a photon, there's a gamma coming out. There's a competing effect for that in which that energy, that extra energy can actually not come out as a gamma ray, but that energy can get transferred into the atom as a whole. And then that energy is used to knock out an electron of the atom. That is called a conversion electron. Um, yeah, so compared to just pure beta decay, this doesn't really have a, a, a continuous spectrum. When we measure the spectrum, we see that there's internal conversion jumps. So this is the beta spectrum, but then we will be able to see that there's internal conversion in those isotopes as well. We see the big peaks. Those are very fixed kinetic energies of, of electrons coming out of different shells due to that energy that could have gone into a gamma ray that it didn't, but instead it was used to knock out uh, an, an electron. Thank you.